our guest, I'm going to bring him on, Ron Douglas today is someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for, man, I don't even know how long we've known each other for such a long time, how long we've known each other, but he's someone that is a New York Times bestselling author before we get this, not a hundred thousand, right? Not a measly half a million, but 1.5 million books sold. He's been making money online in the information digital publishing space since the early 2000s, 2001 to be exact. He started out publishing ebooks, then Amazon books, then got a deal with Simon and Schuster. How many people would like to have a deal with Simon and Schuster here? Put me in the chat box if you'd like to have a deal with Simon and Schuster. Right. So it didn't stop there. So that deal then led to him being featured on. Let me know if you've ever heard of any of these shows here. All right. Surely you guys have heard of some of these shows. Even for those of you guys that are over on the Gold Coast in Australia and you're you're over there in Ireland. Good morning, America. Fox News. NBC. ABC. The Wendy Williams Show, which used to be a favorite of my wife's, HSN, and he's been featured in People Magazine. So not only has he been able to accomplish everything that we just talked about, right? And I think I kind of I glossed over the fact that he's been a money-making information publisher that has made millions of dollars. So we've got two things going on, right? Best New York Times best-selling author with over 1.5 million books sold. He's also got this digital uh, real estate empire, some digital products, sort of what we teach in the micro program. He's made millions of dollars, right? He was able to do all of that and become a multimillionaire as a stay-at-home dad of not one, but two honor roll students, right? So look, this stuff is possible, even for those of us that have families, right? He's now the founder of one of my favorite conferences. I haven't been there in about a year or so, but I'm, I'm going to be a speaker at it this year. WebinarCon, the number one event for webinar marketers. With that said, Ron, man, I, I feel like I'm missing some stuff here. I think there's a lot more that needs to be added to this. I know that you've done a lot more. Because Look, we didn't even talk about real estate because you have a, a ton of real estate that you own as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm humbled by all that. I appreciate you having me on. I'm really just here to hear you say nice things about me because <laughs> it's rare. It's rare. Like I've known you over ten years, so I appreciate that. Did we record that? I hope we recorded. We've it. got it recorded. Yeah, we'll send yeah, it to you. Recorded. <laughs> yeah, we went out for dinner. Thanks, I appreciate you. I mean, I, this is crazy. I, mean, I see seeing all these people that uh, look to you for your your leadership and. I appreciate just seeing the whole thing evolve. Like I remember Kindle cash flow back in the days. Like I, I might have been like the second person to ever promote it yeah. for you back in the days when we were doing webinars. And I remember you had that vision back then. And um we were all selling like little two hundred dollar stuff on webinars and you had your thousand dollar product and had the confidence to sell it. And I remember you saying one thing that inspired me back then to sell higher price stuff. You were saying that uh you know, the reason that you guys don't feel comfortable selling the thousand dollar course and thousand um, dollar program is because you don't believe it's worth that. And people can sense that. Whereas I fully believe the value that it's going to give people that is worth far beyond that. So I can they can sense that I believe in what I'm selling and that's why I can sell it. And that made a whole difference in my life, actually. So I never told I don't know if I ever told you that, but I appreciate you for that. Oh, you never did, but damn, I said that. I, I told you I was cocky as hell back in the day. Uh, <laughs> but no, I believe. The, yeah, it was, it was there, but no, it's so true, right? I think that's a good starting point because there's a lot of people that are, that are entrepreneurs that have successful businesses here. There's people that are looking to start a business, and Dan Kennedy talks about this, right? I remember first getting started with marketing and reading a book by Dan Kennedy. He said, one of the number one problems that most people who are in business have is pricing their product or service at a level where it should be. They're making a mistake of comparing themselves to the competition and, and going with what the competition is pricing. So it becomes this pricing war. And then the second thing is they're lacking the confidence in the actual product or service and what it could provide to the end user. So they, they, they don't go in and sell it. So 
But number one thing to always work on is your confidence in knowing that what I'm putting out there doesn't have to be 100% perfect because you'll never put anything out there, but it's good enough for me to justify the price of that I'm charging. All right, so very cool. Um, Ron, meet my co-host, Caroline, who's over in the UK. She's all the way across the pond. Hi, Ron. Hi, Caroline, Lovely nice to, meet to meet you. Great to meet you. Awesome. Incredible, uh, incredible bio. Ty sent it to me, and then I followed you on Facebook. Um, just phenomenal how you've achieved so much in a short, you know, such a short period of time. That's and it's interesting how humble you are. <laughs> so this. humble. I'm doing this since I had no gray hairs, so definitely not <laughs> a, a short period of time. That's what twenty-two years. Yeah. So yeah, you keep grinding twenty-two Pretty years, sure. you're going to accomplish something. Trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, so look, you, I don't think your goal was to be an entrepreneur initially, right? Because you um you had a you you were a stockbroker at one point, were, were you not? Or I was a financial analyst, never a stockbroker. There you go. Financial financial analyst analyst. And a rela relationship manager for uh, mutual funds and pensions, some of the bigger ones, Templeton and you know, some of the Dreyfus and some of the big financial companies out there I worked for JP Morgan Chase. And uh yeah, I wanted to be a well, I always was an entrepreneur going back, you know, just it's just in my blood. I always sold stuff, always seized opportunities and took risks, even when I was young. And nobody ever told me to go do that. It was just in me to just, OK, I'm going to figure out a way to, to add value and make money. So I had a flea market booth back in the days in college. I had a barbershop. I was cutting hair. I, I did a bunch of stuff just trying to find my way. But what I knew was I needed money. Right. So I went the corporate route to see where it would go. And um, they ended up, they paid for me to get my MBA. They paid for me to become a chartered financial analyst. So I was like heavy on uh, Wall Street and saw that maybe it was an opportunity. Eventually I wanted to start my own hedge fund back in the days. And um, I discovered internet marketing in 2001. And I was like, well, no, this is what I want to do. So I kind of left my corporate uh, goals behind and, and just focused on that. But I'm grateful for uh, JP Morgan Chase. It's where I met my wife, you know, where so many things happen. It's where I got a good foundation on personal finance and investing and just interacting with, with people there that were affluent and wealthy and doing big things. So I appreciate that. I like to say that my combination of learning online marketing early on, you know, and we, we both learn from the same people, you know, like Warrior Forum and Dan Kennedy and the same teachings and also learning finance on Wall Street made a good combination of being able to make money and being able to keep that money. So I'm really uh, grateful for those two experiences. Yeah, being able to keep it is is just as important, if not more important than being able to make it, right? Because you and I, we've been in this industry long enough that we see people who have crashed and burned. Right, they'll come in one moment, they got the nice houses, the Lamborghinis, the great cars, and then two years later, you're like, what what the hell happened to so and so? Uh, I so. just spoke to a guy yesterday, a guy that you know, I'm not gonna say his name. Hopefully say his name, by all means, please say his name. <laughs> no, I can't say his name. And uh, so he he um he hit me up and he he knows I do real estate and investing, and he's asking me how does he get a lien off of his house because the IRS had put a lien on his house because he has back taxes and he wants to sell his house, but he can't with that lien on it because it's not enough money to pay off the mortgage if he has to pay the lien too. Yeah. He's telling me this, right? And I start telling him like, there's, I don't think there's any way you can get a lien off of your house. Like nobody's gonna do that because they want to get paid, right? That the, lien, the house is their collateral, so they're not gonna do that. And he was like, oh man. So I was telling him some different options. You could keep the house, rent it out, take a equity line against it, you know, buy the buy another house with that. I was telling him some different options and then we started talking. He said, thank you. And then he asked me to speak at WebinarCon. And he's like, hey man, did I tell you about this? I was making millions here and millions there. I got this webinar strategy and all that stuff. I'm like, didn't you just tell me that you're like in debt to the IRS and now you want to get on my stage at WebinarCon? I just thought it was Maybe he wants to share irony in it. He wants to share how you can go backwards in business. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah that's why it's I think priding yourself, I look at I look at certain individuals like yourself and then uh, you know, I'm gonna throw myself in there as well, who have had the longevity. And there's a few reasons why you're able to do that. 
Number one, and this is for everyone that's listening, right? Whether you have a business already or don't have one, or you just, you know, care, trying to find something, is being ethical, right? So I truly believe in the law of karma. So being ethical in business and ethical in, in what it is that you provide to people as that product or that service that you're giving people. The things, what goes around comes around. And then number two, is just being someone that is able to stay focused for a moment. I was speaking to someone yesterday and literally every three months or so, this person has a new idea, new business idea. And is equally as excited about all, right? We'll get you excited about it as well. Um, Ron, what's been, look, you've been investing in real estate forever. You've had, I know your series of books, and I want to talk about that in just a moment, right? You've sold over, you've sold over 1.5 million, I'm sure. What made you stay the course or something like that? And not only to the point where you stayed the course, but look, you've got, I want to read off some of your titles. So America's Most Wanted Recipes, More of America's Most Wanted Recipes, America's Most Wanted Recipes Kids Menu, America's Most Wanted Recipes Just Desserts, America's Most Wanted Recipes Without the Guilt, because that's important, right? America's Most Wanted Recipes at the Grill. America's Secret Recipes, one. America's Secret Recipes, two. And, and this is a combination of over 1.5 million. Most people would have stopped that America's Secret Recipes. And then said, I need to go find something else, right? What made you realize the power of this being consistent and linear in that? Yeah, I think you were an inspiration to me by, you know, continuing to sell the same things and conversations I've had with you, actually. But, you know, it's just the opportunity was there. You know, I had a customer list and just looking at it. So, when, I mean, all this stuff, right? When people look at you, when people look at me from the outside in and they look at the things we've amassed, the things we've accomplished, the grand scheme of things, it just seems like, wow, how did you do that? But when you are in it, you know that each step of the way, you're looking at what can I sell next? What do people want? So it's like a thing where it evolves into something big. And it just by just by looking at what people want, what the next opportunity is, what's the low hanging fruit. So that was all just easy for me at the time because it's like, okay, I put this book out, it was a hit. Okay, people like this, I'll do another one and, and another one, and another one, and keep it going and do different themes on the same brand. It, it, the, the hard part is building a brand that people know, right? Building something that people want to buy. The easy part is doing more of the same. So a lot of people don't get that. They just jump from one opportunity to the next without understanding like the opportunity is the easy opportunity. And the, sometimes, the, most times, the best opportunity is to con continue doing what you were already doing and do more of it. Yeah, the, you said something really brilliant there. So that the opportunity building out the brand is that hardest is the hardest part, right? But just continuing to push the opportunity within that brand is the easier part. And I think that one of the benefits is look, uh having a list, right? So when we were coming up in the iron space, I think having a list was preached a little bit more the importance of having a subscriber list, right? This doesn't matter. Look, it doesn't matter if you're someone who uh, sells real estate, if you're a real estate agent, or if you own a laundromat on the corner, right? Or if you are a Kindle publisher, or if you're a digital publisher, you have to have a way for people to know about what it is that you have available for them to go in and buy. And having that list makes it easier. Um, Ryan, you just kind of talked about that. And I think, Oftentimes, as, as business owners, we don't talk about the importance of a list. What what do you do with your list as far as um, how do you cultivate it? How do you take care of it? Uh, do you continuously promote to it? Are you providing value to it? What like what's your stance on how you treat your list? Because I've got one view of how you should treat it, and I think you have a, a different view. Well, I'm curious, what, what's your view on it? Well, you definitely want to be consistent, right? Yeah. So you want to send, if you send every week, send every week, right? I like to send every day, really. But as long as you have something interesting for them, people don't mind you getting emails every day, sending emails every day, because it's something that can help them, something that could benefit them. 
So you want to know your audience, know what they like. You want to use the data from prior emails, prior subject lines to understand what works best for them. And you just want to be consistent. And the other thing is you want to mix it up, right? So what you're doing here with your Zoom, that's a great thing to do in terms of like giving value for free, letting people get on, giving them something that they can use, letting them see your face, letting them get to know you, talking about your stories, which you do a great job of that as well. I also try to focus on that. Just letting them know who you are as a person. Like we're both good dads. We're both, you know, good husbands. We're both family men. We both like to travel and enjoy life and create experience for our kids. So those experiences, you share them and you talk about who you are and what you're doing and what what's on the top of your mind. Sometimes an email could just be as simple as, you know, here's what I learned this weekend you know, what I was doing this weekend, here's what I learned from it. So people really appreciate that. And they see you as a real person and not just a robot, not just somebody that's just sending them ads all the time, all the time. But the other thing I, I learned early on is um, you can blend, you can blend the content value and still promote something at the same time, right? You could blend personal experiences and tell stories and still promote stuff at the same time. So when you learn to combine both where you could actually monetize that, but still come across as a real person that's sharing value, then you can't lose, right? Because people are hooked. People want someone that's doing exciting things that they want to do, right? They want to follow those people. They're, they're attracted to, to those people like a magnet, right? So just being that person, stepping into that role, because the average person is afraid to step into that role and be and be the person that people are looking at as the expert, right? So people gravitate to that person like, oh, this is guy, it's the expert. We were, we were taught that early on, right? Uh, in school, you have yeah. the expert, the teacher standing up there in front of the room, sharing stuff, tell, teaching everybody, and everybody's looking to that teacher. Well, when you step into that role of that person, everybody's looking at you. And most people are afraid of the backlash or afraid, what would people think or have imposter syndrome, maybe I'm not worthy of them looking at me. But, you know, when you're like us, you just know that that's what we do, right? It's what we've always done is yeah. being that expert, being that leader, being that person. And when you're that and combine all those things I just said, you know, you can't can't lose because it's just human nature. It's just consumer psychology. And you're coming at a place from contribution. You know, you're coming at, at it in terms of what, can, what value can I give and what can I, um, as opposed to it being about, you you know even though you you want you're making it personal it's just made me think about some of the training that i do in the fast pass uh program we we focus a lot on okay if we're emailing our readers every day because we encourage people to build like massive reader lists um how can we mix it up how can we mix up the content so it's just not another there's the pre-order for the next book and have you read the existing book type content? And it's interesting because I always, uh, you know, I always find that we get tons of responses to emails when we say something really personal. So, and this is, you know, and it's easy, it's even easy to do this with a pen name. So obviously you haven't got your own brand, uh, you, you know, your, your face personality uh, uh, with some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, but even so people want to find out about, you know, they want to see a picture of your garden many readers do it depends on your reader group of course because you tailor it but they always respond when you talk about your kids or your cake that you've made you know on a on a Sunday or that sort of thing and then they just sort of see that they actually believe that person is real even if they're a logo you know even if they are a a pen name so we're always trying to look in my business at ways of sort of really mixing it up because I notice that when we don't do that then we just sort of lazily just put out content same sort of content every time we just get a ton of unsubscribers because you would wouldn't you just go <laughs> it's just right. uh, you just feel spammed so um it's so it's so so in, that relationship is really really important and the more personal we get the more responses we get and involving the readers as well in you know plot lines and including their pets in stories and all those sorts of things um so it is, but it's it's often people find it when they're doing sort of daily emails when they start in this sort of business, the publishing business, they find it quite hard. What do I, you know, what I know we've got AI now to help us, but you know, we've got to still tailor it. Um, but I think they sometimes find that hard how to mix up the content and engage their audience. So it's sort of you you, you get better at it with experience, don't you? Don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, no, you you you're talking from experience right now, so I can tell. Um, listen to Carolyn, folks. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of 
practicing it, seeing what works. And, you know, you can look at your own email inbox and see what emails you opened and see why and what resonated with you. It's just human nature to, you know, you can model. Like one of the things I got really good at was modeling, modeling people that were successful, modeling people that resonated with me, you know, modeling people that were doing exciting things that I wanted to do that had that audience. And, and those are the things I learned from modeling. Another thing you can get really good at just looking at the data, right? Data is huge. Looking at the data and see what people, what they opened, what they clicked, what made the most sales, what they found valuable, what got the most replies. You know, we could talk, we could talk about email marketing all day. That's like right in my yeah. wheelhouse. So yeah, that, that I'll, be... I'll let you get going, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a million dollar skill that you, um, that you learn. And if you talk about, you know, we were talking, we were talking about branding, like every, every good brand has a face of the brand one way or another. Right. So if you think about all your popular brands, they all have a spokesperson or a face of that brand. So what, another thing I learned from Ty is like, where certain, like I have certain lists and different niches and whatnot that, that I'm not the face of, that I have someone writing it, I have someone else as the face of it. So you don't, you, you attract who you attract, right? But when you bring in another person to be a face of a different brand or, or a co-face or a co-spokesperson for your brand, you, you start to attract a whole new audience. So, you know, yeah. I've done that with partnerships with uh, different people. Like right now we're running ads to, uh, we have a, um, a webinar creation service where we are writing webinars for people, for clients, and we help them promote. So we write the webinar, we help them promote that webinar because we have a network of people that promote webinars. And um, I was uh, looking at the type of people that we're bringing in, and I'm the face of that. And we're bringing in people that, you know, I resonate with, I suppose. And I told Andy, who's my partner, like, we need you to do some ads too. So he's shooting ads now so we could bring in a whole different audience. So he could also be a, a spokesperson. He's a partner, so you might as well put his face on it as well. And it gets us a whole different audience. So, so some of the things I think about when we talk about email and branding. Yeah, because people gravitate towards who they think they're most familiar with, who they most identify with, right? So it's it's and look. Any one of you right now, if you're a man, you could go in and be a woman, meaning in the face of your business, right? If you're uh, if you're a Hispanic female, you can go in and be an African-American male right now, right? Because you can use these identities. You can go in. It's, it's, a, it's a pen name used in a different way. Um, I want to kind of pivot back to what we were talking about with emails really quickly, right? Most people think that they don't, well, we were talking about incorporating your day-to-day -day life and your emails and, and then your messaging. Most people think, well, I don't have anything exciting going on in my life. How am I going to share that in my email? But to your point, Ron, most people also don't have, they're right, they don't have many exciting things going on. So I remember like following some of the uh, first folks who started online businesses in the, in the internet marketing space like Corey Rudo and Yannick Silver, these guys would send out email messages celebrating their birthday or maybe their anniversary or, you know, just different things. And I started to model that, right, going back to modeling. And I remember one of the most successful email campaigns that I ever launched was simply my daughter Summer had a chair or dance competition and we were driving, we weren't even flying, we were driving to the mountains. And I wrote up this email, hey, I'm going to send you this email really quickly because we're on our way up to the mountains. My daughter's got a cheer competition this weekend, and I want to get this out to you before my wife pulls me off the computer. If you want to learn how you can have the freedom to go in and do some cool things with your family on the weekends, here's a resource that will get you there. And I probably sent that email. It worked so damn well. But I ended up adding it to a follow-up series so that anyone that comes into my list that's new, they see that. And I know that that, that one's like a cap machine, right? And there's probably hundreds of others like that that I've, that I've written and put together over the years where you're just talking about your life experiences. Look, my washing machine broke down. I'm going to the laundromat today. And, you know, uh, or today's the first day of my kid going back to school, Right. I finally get more time in a day. Or today's the last day of my kid going back to school. I'm going to have less time to myself in a day. And then here's how that ties into this product. Everything ties back to what it is that you have available, right? So 
Um, Absolutely. All that, those all those reasons, all those life things that happen are good reasons to have a sale too. People love a sale, right? So you can get a are. surge of sales coming in. You know, my daughter was born sale. My daughter graduated sale. You know, anything you can think of. Yeah, life yeah, yeah. Make it a sale. That's great. That that's more powerful than a you know a, a public holiday sale or you know Easter special or those sorts of things because it's so so personal and people just feel like they connect with you because they'll you know they've got their own particular experiences going on. That's really powerful. I don't actually do that. Um, I'm going to do that. I, I love that. I hope everyone's mm -hmm. making loads of notes because I am. <laughs> and I and I teach this stuff in publishing. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, and it, if it takes us down a different road that you wanted to go on, Ty, then obviously we can we can pivot. But one of the things I was thinking as Ron was talking, you know, I did I did know a lot. I hear this a lot from people who are multimillionaires in terms of their their background, what they did when they were a kid. And, you know, in terms of being an entrepreneur from an early age, even though you decided to go through the corporate route, which was clearly a great idea. You know, I always think that's great, isn't it? Because you can get your, I worked uh, alongside JP Morgan uh, colleagues because I worked in the city for a law firm and we shared a building. So um, uh, it's an amazing company to to work with and all the better if you get your master's funded. Um, so that's one of the great things about working for in the corporate world. But when you're, when you're in that, when you're in that space, but also when you then decided that you, you wanted to sort of set up businesses of your own, did how did you sort of get into the habit of thinking big um, and taking bigger risks? I, I know the obvious answer would be to me, you scale it. You're not going to take, you know, you're going to get bigger and then you, you scale taking more risks and everything. But did you ever get to a point with that? Well, first of all, how did you get into that mode of thinking? Did you like train yourself? Um and also, secondly, were there times when it was really uncomfortable, you know, running out of money, that, or, or was it all just carefully scaled over the years? It's a lot in there. Those are good know. questions. Good questions. First question, I, I would say that I was just around people that were doing it, right? Just put yourself around yeah. people that are doing the things you want to do. Just get in groups, go to events, meet people, talk to people, you know, join groups online. Join, we used to have message boards and forums we would join, and then we would start meetups from the people that were in that, those message groups just to kind of be around, to surround yourself with people that are doing things you want to do, and, and you'll figure it out. And and as you're doing more and more stuff, you would start to get confidence, right? So I don't see it as as ris risky. I thought staying at that job was risky because they were going to lay me off. They did lay me off, right? That, that was yeah. risky, you know, trying to like – put my future in their hands and trying to depend on them for promotions and whatnot. That was the risky thing. The easy thing for me, which was doing something I had confidence in doing something that I knew worked. So what some people see as risk, I see as calculated, you know, risk, something that's a high probability of happening. Like if I spend money on these ads to build this list, I know I'm going to have this list that I can monetize, yeah. you know, so that was, didn't seem risky. That just seemed like building an asset. For me so yeah so it's just the way I, I, I looked at it and I think it's going back to getting out of your comfort zone right like you and i were at this event over the weekend and uh initially ron didn't have a ticket i think the they sold out of the tickets right and the last option available was the thirteen thousand dollar ticket now, Ron could obviously go in and buy a gazillion of those. He could probably buy a few million of those $13,000 tickets, but it wasn't feasible for him. So, and and I don't think any, there was many people who would have paid about 13000 So we texted him back and forth by messenger, and I'm like, dude, I got a couple of extra tickets. And he's like, I'm going to come right down, right? So without reservation, without overthinking it, right? He happened to live outside of Atlanta or somewhere around there. And he was there an hour, hour and a half later, where I think there were other people who would have thought about it and said, and, and in fact, there are uh, two or three other people that I offered the same ticket to. And those people talked themselves out of it, talked themselves out of being in a room with multimillionaires and billionaires. How crazy does that sound? Right? The first thing that he said was, 
I've got my webinar con event, which is a super successful event. He gets a ton of people there, a ton of high quality people. But looking at this event that has over 20,000 people, I know it's going to be inspiring. So even at his level, he's still learning and still putting himself, himself in these positions of, 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 of getting inspired. Like what goes behind that? Is that something that can be taught? Is that something that's innate? Is it, is it you just do it? How does someone, you know, develop that type of uh, thinking? Yeah, what they say, uh, action takers are the money makers and success loves speed and all those quotes that uh, we both love to use. Yeah. It's so true, right? It's like, okay, I know you were there. I know I had some other friends there. I've heard of the event. And I'm like, okay, I have my event coming up. So as you said, I just want to go there, see everything that's going on, see their success. And it inspires me to think bigger, right? Sometimes, like I was just saying, you got to be exposed to different things to show you what's possible, to show you the size of the market, the size of the opportunity. And I knew that's what was going to happen by me going there. Now I'm thinking bigger, like how could we make my event bigger? How could we do some different things to make it appeal to a broader audience? So now I'm talking with my, my partners trying to figure out how to do that because of what I saw at, at Invest Fest. And, you know, I knew, um, I knew one of the founders and, uh, and a, a few of the speakers. So I was like, hitting them but behind the scenes when you told me about it I was hitting them on Instagram trying to see if they could get me in as well so I was going to be there one way or another like um Nehemiah Davis is in that that circle right so when uh when I met him was in 2020 when we first did WebinarCon and we were sold out the event was sold out all the tickets were gone no there was no order button on the sales page but Nehemiah didn't take no for an answer. He just showed up at the event. I remember that event. Yeah, yeah. You were were you there? No, you know you there. Were, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he he shows up at the event with with five thousand dollars in hand, <laughs> like ready, saying, "Hey, you know, there's any because there's always cancellations or whatnot. If any, see if you can get me in the room." And this was on the second day, so he didn't hear about the event until the 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 night before, and he knew that he wanted to be in that room, so he shows up. With money in hand, what are we going to say? No, we took the money. We're like, who is this guy? And now all of a sudden he's on our radar and we featured him from the stage. And he's like become this big, you know, influencer now. But um, in 2020, nobody, I didn't really know who he was. And that's how I met him. And now he's speaking at WebinarCon. He's on our stage, you know, so stuff like that. It's like sometimes you got to learn. It, it's, it's also easier to um, ask for uh forgiveness than permission sometimes so sometimes you got to push the envelope to see where it goes and and make things happen and not take no for an answer and people respect that right people that are organizing these things and i'm not telling anybody to show up at webinar con if it's sold out per se but what i'm saying is you just got to seize the opportunity and not take no for an answer and that's a good well, look, you're telling the story right so i mean it, it, it made an impression and and i'm thinking about that and i'm i'm picturing him and like I can definitely see him doing that, right? Just going in and saying, you know, I need to be in this room. And he wanted to be in that room because, again, there were highly successful individuals that are in that room, right? There's people that are doing the things that he wants to get better at, even though he's already super successful in his own right, right? Um, someone just asked, where did you start? And I think that, look, I kind of gloss over the fact that uh, you started in Queens, New York, you didn't have a silver spoon in your mouth, right? It's easy to see where you're at right now and think that, oh my God, this guy had a path laid out for him. What, what, did you, what, what is that? So Queens, New York, basically, how far away from 50 Cent the Rapper did you live? Um, that's one of my own personal questions. No, I'm just joking here. But, but Queens is where uh, 50 Cent is from, as well as Run DMC and LL Cool J and just a lot of individuals. But what is your your backstory? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Hollis, Queens, so it's exactly where Run DMC was uh, was from, and Tribe Called Quest, and a lot of these music bands. Um, Fifty Cent was on the north side. He was on he was on the south side. I was on what's called North North Side Queens, which really wasn't North Side Queens. It was like Southeast Queens, but they called it North Side to be opposite of South Side. So South Side was you know where the uh, the projects were. Unfortunately, I didn't I didn't grow up in the projects because my grandfather, you know, if it was just my mother, I would have probably grown up, grow up grew, grown up exactly where 50 Cent was from. He was about 15 minutes away. Um, but my grandfather did some great things. And I'm 
appreciative of him to be able to grow up in a in a house and not apartment buildings. But you know, it was still an area where drugs hit us pretty hard, right? The crack epidemic of the the 80s growing up in that area. And prior to that, my um so I don't know how deep you want me to go into the story, but so so my mother was uh 18 years old. She was hooked on heroin. She was hooked on drugs. She was in a heroin rehab clinic at the time. She met my father, who was also in that heroin rehab clinic, and they fell in love and started to clean up their act. And um, when she turned 19, they they got married. They got married in uh, April of 1974, and he was found dead in August of 1974, that oh. same year. And he was also a drug dealer. So we don't know to this day, we don't know whether he overdosed. He was found overdosed on a, a rooftop in Harlem. We don't know whether he overdosed or whether he was killed to this day. It's a mystery. And um, six weeks later after he died, so they got married. He died. They were pregnant. Six weeks later, I was born. So I never met my dad and my mother went through a crisis because, you know, you can imagine a 19 year old woman, with just having a kid, you know, newborn baby for the first time, husband just passed, she's a widow. She went back on to drugs. She went back on to uh, like having depression and all type of stuff. So that was kind of like my beginning. So that's why I grew up with my uh, my grandparents and my grandfather, he was an alcoholic. So they, and they, <laughs> it was a two family house and they used to rent the, the top floor to some crazy people. And we had different things, shootouts and SWAT teams come to the house. So, you know, all type of crazy stuff. I can go, I've seen a lot. I can go into some stories. But the main thing I say, I say that for is to say, you know, there's two directions you can go with that. It's two ways you can take that as a young kid. You could say, you can use it as an excuse. Like, I'm never going to be anything. You know, this is why, this is the reason. Or you can use it as motivation. Like, my life is never going to be like that. I'm going to do better. My family is going to have a traditional life. And that's the route I took. I used it as motivation to have a traditional family. Now, my kids, you know, don't realize how good they have it, right? They're super privileged. They've been in great schools their whole life, good neighborhoods their whole life, and you do it just, honest to be able to do that for them. You do it her second year of summer, right? Yep, yep, second year. She's a yeah. she made the honor roll. My son made the honor roll. I'm super proud of them. Yeah. So, and, and uh, actually, my wife, I was telling you, Ron, over the weekend, and I actually was talking about uh, uh, yesterday about this, Ron. So my wife wants our daughter Summer to go to Spelman as well. So Ron's kind of, um, we're going to have a little tour of Spelman. And if you guys are not sure or familiar with what Spelman is, it's an HBCU, which is highly recognized, one of the best schools in the country. So, and you might look, you could, so I think that everyone has had an occasion in their life where they could say, I'm this way because of this set of circumstances, or you could say, I'm this way because of this set of circumstances, right? Same sentence, same phrase, different outlook. I'm this way for the worse because of this set of circumstances. I'm this way for the better. And Ron, you choose to be this way for the better, which not only, I, I, I think it affected not only um, you as an individual and the contributions that you give, right, to people, uh, you affected well over hundreds of thousands of lives, I'm sure, in a positive way. But also, most importantly, you affected your own family, right? You, 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 your daughter, your son, your wife, we vacationed together, we've done things together, and I see how, man, you've just given them, like you said, they don't even realize how good they probably have it, like my kids, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we carry those scars. I know you have, you know, I know your background and I'm pretty sure you've told it to your folks here and you have some stories as well and some stuff that you had to overcome so you can relate, you understand. You probably had it even crazier, some of the stuff that you've told me. So, you know, it's crazy. It's like you you carry these things with you and they always motivate you, but they're still with you. So um, I remember um, my mom, She we had a rocky relationship because I was always trying to, when she was on drugs, I was trying to keep the kids away from her and and... and and uh, it was a lot of regrets, um, things I wish I would have done differently. And uh, when she passed in 2019, I spoke at her funeral. And, you know, I didn't realize I was carrying so much with me. And she, um, 
you know, you you think I'm like I'm Ron Douglas. I'm this New York Times bestselling author. I've, I've spoken on TV. I've spoken on stages around the world. I've you know I, I've done all this stuff. Shit, that's what I'm you like, say to me. I, I was telling them last week that I walk around the house saying I'm the shit every once in a while. So you're thinking I'm Ron Douglas. I'm the shit. Right. And I get up there, man. And I, I start talking about her and I look over and see her and I just fall apart. Man. I just start crying and I can't contain myself. And I'm just like, I, it was all just coming out. Yeah. And it was like super embarrassing. <laughs> but, but at the same, you know, I thought it was. But at the same time, my wife told me that was the most powerful speech I ever gave. You know, my kids, I kind of said, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, you know, they never saw me cry, right? And I said, yeah. I'm sorry. That that happened, and um, my daughter was like, "Don't worry about it. It was because you're a good person." Mm. So that really meant a lot to me. It's and, amazing uh, how yeah. you can. It's amazing how you can contain that and not realize it's still so powerful until you get the sort of cri crisis situation. You know, something like that happens, and all that trauma. Um, and everything just comes straight to the surface, doesn't it? So it was a good thing, you know, obviously that that happened. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Although it didn't absolutely. feel like it at the time. And the same yeah. thing that motivates you is still with you, right? The same, that same trauma and all that. So, yeah, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing. And, you know, you don't want to be me, <laughs> you know, you want to be, um, be yourself and, and run your race and right? never look at someone else, their success and, and, you don't know what went into that and what they had to do and what they had to overcome. So always run your own race, not worry about comparisons or whatever anybody else is doing. Man, that is so powerful. You know, I, I never knew that, Ron, as I'm listening to you talk about that. Um, it's eerie and the similarities um, because our moms died in the same year, 2019. My mother died in 2019. And uh, the same thing happened to me at her funeral. So I get up there and I'm used to speaking to people all the time, right? I already had in my head what I was going to say to a degree. And I get up there and I just boom, fall apart. And Coach Shawar, who's actually listening, once down, he was there. He, had, he basically had came up to my mom's funeral. And uh, we have these things sometimes where we need to get it out. And the environment that we're in allows us to get it out, right? And just like you, I'm like, man... I don't even remember what the hell I really said, to be honest with you, because my emotions got the best of me. But everyone, to this day, will still tell me how you said some really cool things and powerful things, and your mom, you know. But I want to kind of pivot really quickly because we're coming down to the last few minutes, and I want to make sure that we cancel your time. Um, a few things. So someone asked, where did you get your start? Like, look, you've had all the success. What was one of the first things that made you aware of um, – just like I could sell stuff. Like, what was that first thing that you ended up selling? Mm. Going back to childhood or like real business? No, no. I mean, online or oh, online. as an author. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I went. So, I, as I was doing uh, grad school, right, I was doing my MBA at um, Baruch College, and um, there was a, a guy there that went to the same college as me and we used to like study together in grad school and he got a job working for a company that did uh email marketing pretty much and they had contracts with AT&T and MCI so they used to promote cell phone contracts back then um you know 2000 2001 he was working working 2000 he was working for them and he was in charge of sending out the emails he was like the the email manager and um he told me about like what he's doing and he's like, all I do is push, push send. And then all this money comes into the company and I just write these emails. I push send and all, I'm like, wow, this was, you know, 2000. I'm like, seriously, that's all you have to do. You don't have to sell anything like personally one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to, you know, meet with anybody. You don't have to, you know, do a whole thing. And he's like, no, they have this database. I send the emails, the company makes money. That's what I do. Sometimes he's like, he was telling me sometimes, I remember the conversation. He said, you know, I, I'm scheduled to work eight hours, but sometimes I, I work 90 minutes of actual work, but the company likes it because they're making so much money. So that created a light bulb moment for me because, 
you know, I've done a lot of things. I've done MLM, I've done Amway and Quick Star, and I used to sell Cutco knives, and I was always attracted to financial freedom and opportunity. But when he told me that, I'm like, I don't have to go do a presentation in somebody's house to, you know, to make extra money. I can just day. push push the button, right? I can just type something up, push the button, and that generates money. So that's all I wanted to do after that. After I learned, just just man, how can I do that on a higher level? How, who can I follow that's already doing that? You know, so I started out this building. I started out building lists, promoting um, products as an affiliate, mainly ClickBank products as wow. an affiliate. And um, then I said, okay, you know, I'm promoting all these other people's products and they're on this marketplace on ClickBank and they have all these people promoting them. That seems to be where the money is to have my own product and have all these other people like me, all these affiliates promoting that product. And that was another light bulb moment. So I was kind of looking for what I could uh, sell on ClickBank at the time. And, and being that I had done a lot of different things with my, um, I had a PO box where I was selling stuff, you know, the PO box was the address. And I used to get a lot of offers to the PO box because my address was kind of out there. And uh, one day this offer came and it was like, it was, you know, send us $10 and we'll send you these 10 secret restaurant recipes from these different restaurants with resale rights. Oh, wow. I didn't even know what resale rights were. So that's yeah. what happened because I was selling stuff via mail order for my PO box. And I'll tell you about the, how that whole thing worked. Probably another conversation for that, but I'll tell you, basically I was out there selling stuff, uh, selling information products through the mail yeah. <laughs> at the time. And um, I didn't and that I just like, wow, I could put this on ClickBank. There's nothing out there like that on ClickBank. So that's what led to the whole thing. So that's how it started. Just being in the game, just walking down that path, that opportunity came and I'm like, wow, this is it. I could put it out there. And I was, I was working at Chase at the time and I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, I, th I didn't know it was going to, had no idea it would become what it was, what it, what it became with TV appearances and millions of books and all that stuff. So I just created a little ebook on in front page. <laughs> it was so you published it first before so you published it and made it available to the public first and then how did Simon and Schuster come into play did they get wind of like the volume that you like what did that look like yeah so I published that on ClickBank it was a hit I started self-publishing I made a real cookbook out of it added more recipes put it on Amazon and it was a whole thing on its own right you remember me when I was selling self-publishing cookbooks I didn't get the book there with Simon and Schuster until 2008 so from 2002, 2003-ish to 2008, yes. I was just self-publishing, right? And I had sold about 60,000 copies of, of that title and um, built a big email list. So so I met Simon & Schuster, um, the guys there, through – so so. I was uh, – so Mike Filsame lived 35 minutes from me. He's another internet marketing guru – guy and at the time he was only the second person to have a million dollar product launch right in our million dollars a day. yeah i think he might have done it in four days five days or something like that yeah but just a million dollars total he was on i think he was only the second person in our industry well he claims to be that that's that's done that so i was attracted to him in terms of like i'm gonna you know he lives he's my local guru you know, he's, I'm going to make this guy my mentor or whatnot. Even though I started before him, he had, he was full-time and had all the success. So I was like trying to learn everything I could from him and, and show up at his office and, you know, get more involved by his products and all that type of stuff. And uh, which is a great way to get to, to know somebody, right? You buy their products, they have to listen to you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so if you, if you guys want to get to know Ty better, buy all his products. I guess you guys are here, so you already Become have. Become a preferred so already, customer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so... Right. um. So Mike Fulsaim, he uh, he had a friend, Adam Weiss, who you also met, that was a publicist. So Adam was looking to get publicity for Mike, and he wanted to do a story on Mike and the success stories of people that bought Mike's products. So Mike referred him to me, and I started telling him what I have accomplished with the books and the, all that stuff. So, you know, America's Most Wanted Recipes is a book about copycat restaurant recipes. Right, how to make your favorite dishes from Olive Garden, Red Loft, all the chain restaurants, TGI right. Fridays, KFC. Oh, so nice. I had a series of books about that. Right. So that was like my my niche, my thing. 
But what was crazy about it, it was it was a niche, but it was also a mainstream thing. So it was a niche in terms of like that particular theme, but it appealed to everybody that cooked and wanted to buy cookbooks. So it was a rare thing where it was both a niche and a mainstream opportunity at the same time. So I didn't see it as a mainstream opportunity until I met Adam Weiss, until I met Tom Bill too. He told me like, this is bigger than you think. So Adam started telling me like, listen, I can get you publicity for this. And first I thought he was trying to hustle me. And I thought that, um, you know, like this guy just wants me to pay for his services. This wasn't about Mike at all, but no, he was serious. He was like, I can get you on TV for this. So I ended up paying him for publicity and he had a, um, so he ended up, before I got the book there with Simon Schuster, he got me, he had a friend that, um, he, he got me a, an appearance at uh, Fox Business. And I went on Fox Business with a self-published book, which is hard to do. Usually you got to have a publisher behind you. I was on there yeah. with a self-published book doing an interview. And they went with the story of, uh, this is right around the time I left my job. They went with the story of a uh, local Long Island man leaves his job on Wall Street to pursue his passion of cooking, right? So this is like after I got laid off in 2007. Right so they loved that story. And, and then Adam took that story, took the books, um, created a book proposal for it and started pitching that to different book publishers. And within 90 days of them doing that, I had two offers. One was from Simon & Schuster, $100,000 to uh, do two books. So I took that <laughs> offer. So then Adam also had a, uh, his girlfriend worked at the New York Post. And um, they, he, he introduced her to me and they loved the story of I cracked the code. I found the secret to KFC's uh, original chicken recipe. It was like a secret that, you know, and I told him all along, I didn't find a secret to it. I just have a, ver a version of it that comes close. Right. right. They, yeah, they sent reporters to the house. Right. To the story. They ran with that story of a uh, local, uh, local man cracks the code on KFC. And Please being, I was living in New York city at the time. Um, a lot of the local news stations look to the newspapers for stories. Right. So what can we have on our show? So they saw that story and they're like, man, let's bring them on. So I started getting all this publicity and this, you know, I had the book there with Simon Schuster behind me and that's how it kind of just dominoed. Nailed that. that. Nailed yeah. that. Do you know yeah. when you, so you were publishing these um, America's um, Most Wanted oh, Recipes boy. and all the different, all the different, very, uh, all the different books that came from that. So you're doing that for six years before this big, big, I mean, already really successful, but big, 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 for people to give right. up multiple times, six years, right? Six yeah. years. And and how many books at this stage by after six years, two thousand and eight, whatever it was? Yeah, it's all sixty thousand self published, around yes. sixty thousand before wow. I got the book deal. So I had an audience. That's another thing you could take from this. I had an audience. I built a platform. I had what was a low risk proposition for them because they saw like, okay, this guy, this you know, the part time, he's selling these cookbooks. People want this book. <laughs> So it was an easy decision. It was a slam dunk for them. And then they took it and their distribution just spread it everywhere, right? I was in all the Barnes and Nobles. I was in, you know, Scholastic Book Fairs. You ever go to like a book fair for your kid and it's run by Scholastic Book Fairs at your local school? I was in there like You're my there. daughter <laughs> would be showing off my book to her friends. This is my dad's book. You know, it was and it started you know, with one yeah. with one book. When you were do when you were going through with that experience and all the um exposure that you had and all the backing that you had as well, did you ever uh branch into physical from that? I mean, we very much talk about online is the way to go. And I know that the the cookbooks would have been initially hardcover and um, paperback, whatever. So um, yeah, the bookstores everywhere. Like I remember being yeah. at the airport saying uh, your books and taking a picture. And I think I said, this was years back. And I think I might have sent it to you. So, okay. But you know what I, um, I mean? What I mean is thinking like the ninja foodie sort of thing at the moment. So did you then go into like physical products, like cooking utensils and all that sort of stuff? Or did you, did you stay within the book space? Yeah, that that's all physical products, aprons and cooking utensils. Yeah, yeah, like that's that. what I'm thinking. So I had, I had a big email list of that, you know, for that niche, right? So I was nice. selling everything I could could think of, but none hit yeah. as big as the uh, the cookbooks. It's, it's you know, it's really lightning in the bottle, right? You could take a lot of lessons from what I've just shared, but honestly, I wish I could do that every five years. You know, I wish I could do that, the same thing again, but some of it was kind of just walking the path and, opportunity came and I was just blessed with certain opportunities, like kind of like lightning in the bottle, you know, at the right time. And carefully right following the right, the right people. Time. 
Yeah, and, and and then going to the people that you needed as as much as they sort of needed you. You know, finding out the you know the the best people to have as a mentor and that sort of thing is key, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And then it For becomes sure. your network that that helps mm-hmm. you then move forward, providing you've got the talent and the products mm-hmm. which you have. It's incredible. Oh my goodness! It comes in so many different forms, right? Because someone had asked here, uh, Ron, are you? Number one, are you do you like to cook? And are you an author? Like, do you like to write? Like, and even if the answer is, and I love to, to know uh the answers, but even if the answer is no to both of those, the talent could be getting people that love to cook and love to write, and now you're leveraging their ability to do that, right? And while they create it, you go in and publish it. So do you like to write and do you like to cook? I'm not a chef or anything. Uh, it was one point in my life where I did like to cook a lot, but that wasn't the reason I got this book deal. And that wasn't, I can't attribute that to my success because my wife cooks better than I do. Right. I like to create things and I like to market things and I like to put stuff out there and, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, you know, just a hustler at heart, I guess. But, uh, yeah. you know, no, we had people working with us. We had chefs that we hired to test the recipes. We had a big community of people, you know, we had, uh, like a, a message board with like 250,000 people we had a big email list as well. So we were, people were submitting recipes to us. So a lot of it was curated and outsourced. Nice. There you and go. That's, that's the message that I wanted to share there. Look, you don't have to be the expert. You could be the expert. My wife says to me, uh, this was a couple of years ago and I just got tired of doing things. And I'm like, man, I want to, sh- I want to, I got to find my passion. She's like, you already found your passion. Your passion is in making money, right? And I was like, holy crap, she's right. But so you you just have to be the expert in that thing. Ryan says he's the expert in marketing. He's a brilliant marketer, right? He may not be the best uh, chef. He may not be the best writer, but he's he's good at getting eyeballs to this final product, whatever it may be. So um, sometimes we think at the brand too. Yeah, and that's it. And is prepared to hustle like crazy to do it. No, he's not a hustler. He he always gets on me for working too much. Uh, <laughs> no. Initially, hustle, hustle, big time. Yeah, no, I used to be hustle mode, right? Until, yeah. uh, but you know, I, I slow down a lot. I, I, like you said something this weekend. Like you're, you you feel the best about your life when you're in hustle mode. When you're in a state of flow. And I agree with you. I, I feel the best about myself and about my life and having the most fun when I'm in that state of flow as well. And we talked about this too. It's like, you're really good at making money, but when money is the only thing that, yeah. that should focus, once you have it, it's like, it's not the same motivation. Right? There's so, no driver after that. what do you say? It's, it's, there's not the same driver after that, right? You're not driven the same reason. right it's not the same drive because you already have it right like you're already financially free so it, it's not it's a driver to a point but once you get to that point it's like diminishing value for you you know the more you you make so you kind of have to i think we both are at the stage of our lives where you you kind of have to find something that motivates you other than just money like where you something that gets you out of bed to say okay i'm gonna serve these people or i'm gonna do this thing or make this impact and that's how you take the next leg in, in your career and find something you want to do the, the rest of your life. And maybe for you, it's, uh, you know, helping people with digital publishing and, and seeing the, you know, the results that you're getting for people with your knowledge and experience. And, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I'm still trying to, I mean, webinar kind is great and all. I, I teach people webinars, but I don't see it as my passion. So we're always kind of looking for what's that next thing. So whenever you succeed, whenever you achieve anything, you think, okay, at some point you've made it, but you always get to that point and you're like, okay, what's next? Like, I can yeah, do yeah. bigger things. I have more potential. I can do better. Like, And it's always that dilemma of like, what do I do next? What's going to motivate me to get out of bed every morning? And just having that alone is a blessing. So if you guys are in that stage where you have something, even, even if, if it's just money right now that motivates you, if you have something that gets you up in the morning and uh, inspires you and gives you purpose, that is the blessing. That is the thing, right? The, so the, the journey is the excitement. Achieving yeah. it is great short term, but then it fades. But the, the journey, being in the grind, being in a state of flow, that is what makes life special. 
and make like, yeah. it makes life exciting. So uh, yeah. if you have that, congratulations. Like you're in a, a great place in life. And yeah. an, an ability to create something that doesn't exist. It does exist in some other format from, you know, mo we model like, you know, like you said uh, earlier, we're into big time modeling. Um, but even just create, uh, not even just, I don't know why I keep using the word just. I've noticed I do that just. I'm going to stop doing that. Um, even launching a new pen name. I was saying this is the most so exciting because it's like from scratch. This thing doesn't exist. So what's it going to look like? And uh, it is it's fantastic because it's so creative. And you've got this, okay, let's get to the first 100 subscribers. Let's get to the first. And it, and it's just fantastic because it, it's sort of like you're, you're starting all these projects that you just don't, it's a different level of excitement to starting a project if you're working in maybe, maybe the corporate world or whatever, which can be very exciting as well. Um, and we've both done that. But it's just that whole purpose and goal. And, you, you know, a lot of people here are driven as I am at the moment because I'm not as big as you guys in my business but uh driven by the making money financial security thing that's sort of driving me for a few years into the into the business um and it's great that you can serve others while you're doing that because that's essentially what it what it's about but um, yeah uh, but it, and it's interesting isn't it how you don't need to do all of that now but you still have that drive to, you know, how can I get better? How can I do better? How can I help more people and serve others? And that's where you often find that people come from that place of contribution. They're the most successful people on the planet. Yeah, like you absolutely. Guys, you know? They say someone um, asked me in the questions, uh, what is my quote? And I would say my favorite one is uh, you can get everything you want in life. If you just help other people get what they want. Right. I think that is that Henry Ford, I believe. Hey, hey, Zig Ziglar, Zig Ziglar. Right, right. Zig Ziglar. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's turning over in his grave right now, saying, <laughs> "Yeah, it just slipped my mind. I knew that was Zig Ziglar. It's actually in my presentation. That's one of the quotes in my presentation in my uh, webinar." Yeah. No, this was no, okay. this was great, man. Um, I think everything that you shared for our audience here, people are taking notes. I think you've given us a lot of insight. We definitely had to get you back for part two because I feel like I could talk to you for a while. And you know what's crazy is. Ron and I hang out uh, every so often. We haven't hung out much since the, the pandemic, but before that, we used to go on cruises and all this all types of stuff. But I spoke to you more here than when we actually are hanging out and in person, because we're both pretty quiet guys. We don't really talk much, right? So we'll be sitting at the table not saying jack. As a matter of fact, <laughs> at this, we were sitting across from each other. And we didn't really even say much, right? But there's all these other side conversations. It's going. interesting. It's interesting here today how you've both given each other feedback about how you inspired Ron and and how Ron inspired you. So you and you've not shared that yeah. privately, but you've just sort of brought that here. So, yeah, amazing. Yeah, this is great. Uh, finding your purpose. Hey, Ron, webinar pound, right? So, webinar pound is for people that are running webinars right now. People that are using webinars as a marketing tool, a promotional tool. What could, if someone is watching this, because we're going to stream it outside of this as well, we'll post it a few other places. Where could they get more information on WebinarCon? Um, and then where could they find you as well? Right. Well, WebinarCon.com, simple. Uh, you can go there and find all the information about the event. Uh, you can get on the email list if you want to as well. We have different... Uh, information we'll send you about the event and different uh, interviews where we interview some of the speakers and they'll talk about like what's working for them prior to the event. We have a pre-event party, all that type of stuff. Uh, you can find me rondouglas.com one S rondouglas.com or on Facebook or Instagram is Mr. Ron Douglas. Cause someone else took Ron Douglas, but you know, I'm easy to find. You can Google me and you could, you could find my uh, pretty much everything you need. Yeah. And then go in and check out some of his, his recipe books. Go in and buy a couple of these things. Um, America's Most Wanted Recipes. I actually bought them back in the day because I wanted to see, you know, why everyone was buying these things. Um, so I kind of was funnel hacking what you were doing there. America's Most Wanted Recipes, just desserts. America's Most Wanted Recipes, kids' menus. I mean, there's something for everyone here. America's Most Wanted Recipes at the grill, without the guilt. Uh, America's Secret Recipe, so definitely go over to Amazon, go to your local bookstore, grab one of these things and support Ron. Um, 
as well, right? So. And let us know in the Facebook group, like, what was your biggest takeaway? So you can go in and tag myself, tag Caroline, tag Ron in the Facebook group, any one of our groups. Uh, you can go to any of the groups, the Michael Offers group, the KCF group. You can go to the Fast Pass group. You can go to the Traffic and Marketing Mastery group. You can go to the any of the other groups that we have and tag Ron. Tag myself, let us know, tag Caroline, let us know what your biggest takeaway was. And hopefully if we get enough comments, we can guilt Ron into uh, coming back for a part two. All right, so here we go. Ron, I'd love to, man. This is an honor. Thanks for having me on. And appreciate this was a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody, for listening. All right, thanks. Thanks, Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Stay Stay well. Thanks, everyone.